Emerson was fascinated by language. In Nature, 1836, his first book, he in fact has one whole chapter on language. And he's interested in language in this chapter insofar as the natural world is the origin of language. Meaning that if I have a thought, which of course is in my interior, I need to find a way to make it exterior. Well, how do I do that? According to Emerson in Nature, I look to the natural world to find images, concrete processes that will allow me to make my thought visible to myself and others. So in this regard, the origin of language is nature and the language, the words that come from this natural imagery are the most powerful words. Those are the words of the poet. So Emerson is very interested in nature in words that are highly particular, concrete. It ultimately says that all, almost all words, if you look at their etymology, originate in some kind of natural process. So he goes on to say in that essay that language ultimately is a mirror. It allows us to mirror back to ourselves concretely our own thoughts. And the more concrete our language, the closer it is to nature, the more powerful it would be. By the time Emerson is writing The Poet throughout the early 1840s, an essay he publishes in 1844, he has further thoughts about language. He's still interested in the idea that we need concrete imagery to express ourselves. We need language, concrete language, to manifest our thoughts and feelings. But in the poet, he's very interested in language as something dynamic, fluxional, constantly metamorphosing. He makes a distinction in the poet between the mystic and the poet. He says, for the mystic, a symbol remains the same all the time. A symbol has the same meaning in every instance. So if I'm a mystic, I might say, oh, a cross means X, and it always means X. Or a rose means Y, and it always means Y. In other words, if I'm a mystic, my language is static. It ultimately wants to pin down meaning once and for all. Doesn't want ambiguity, doesn't want equivocation, uh, doesn't want transformation. The poet, on the other hand, realizes that a cross can symbolize one thought or feeling one minute, but then another thought or feeling another minute and another and another, so on and so on and so on. The same with the rose, the pine cone, the river, anything. So Emerson is very much in favor of language, not as a set of conventions that pins down meaning. He's interested in language as a sort of force that is constantly in motion, that is constantly upsetting stability, that is constantly undercutting uh, univocal moments in favor of a kind of polyvocal energy. And you might ask, well, why, why would this be? I thought language was a tool that helps us communicate clearly with one another. Well, it is. But this is what we might call ordinary language, the kind of language we use when we write an op-ed in the newspaper, or the kind of language we use when we're talking to one another in a classroom setting like this. But what Emerson would probably call poetic language or literary language is not so much about denotation, it's more about connotation, meaning that words should not so much convey a meaning as generate intellectual and emotional energy. So for me to read an Emerson passage in which a word means one thing at the beginning of the passage, but something entirely different at the end of the passage, what's he done? Emerson has ripped that word away from a traditional definition and given it all sorts of new definitions which of course challenged me to rethink not only my understanding of that word, but also why I have tended to put that word with the definition I've put it with all these many years. So Emerson is unmooring words. He's dislocating words. He's ripping words out of traditional context. And this ultimately puts a lot of onus on the reader in reading his work to move with him and to be open to defining words in new ways ourselves as he defines words in new ways in the essay. This is why Emerson in The American Scholar says, there is creative reading as well as creative writing. When words become dense with manifold allusion, he says in that essay, 
then the reader must be very imaginative and open and energetic to get into the spirit of that writer. And ultimately, I create my own meanings um, in reading Emerson because his essays invite that kind of active interpretation. When you get to the end of an Emerson essay, there's not a sense of a, a bow tying everything up nice and neat and you're done. There's a sense of um, openness and again, ambiguity, incompleteness. And the reader, him or herself, their self must work to bring a sense of completeness to that, knowing of course that each person will have his or her their own sense of completeness. So I want us to pay attention to that as we go through Emerson and not get frustrated when he is seemingly confusing, realizing that he's ultimately being rather self-consciously ambiguous given his idea of what literary language should do.